Buenas tardes. Happy Pride Month, everyone. I am Dr. Rosemary Celaya Alston, and I'm here with my climate comadres, both Consuelo Zaragoza and Marie Dahlstrom. On behalf of Tia Chucha Centro Cultural and Bookstore, Familias en Acción and Abuelas en Acción, a multicultural podcast for our common good, welcome you to our conversation with Dr. Michael Mendes author of Climate Change from the Streets, How Conflict and Collaboration Strengthen the Environmental Justice Movement. Dr. Mendes writes about environmental policies in California, with many being the result of community residents at the front lines of pollution, resisting, protesting, and collaborating with the state for more equitable environmental policies. His book, Climate Change from the Streets, provides valuable lessons learned for replicating equitable climate action policies across the United States. Today's author reading is part of our Climate Comadre series focused on equitable climate solutions that benefit all community members, including those who are the most vulnerable. Our knowledge and actions are rooted in optimism and hope knowing that we, the people, have the power for equitable climate action. Ayana Elizabeth Johnson and Catherine Wilkinson Wright. Can you imagine the community that we heal the climate crisis? It will not be just you. It will be a techno technological salvation. It will be all of us. Thank you to Karen Ugarte and Pia Chucha's team for all they did to make this event possible. And thank you to Familias en Acción in Portland, Oregon for their wonderful support for Abuelas en Acción, a podcast for our multicultural common good. You can purchase climate change from the streets through Tia Chuchas with the link available on the chat. Please post any comments or questions on that chat as Dr. Mike will respond to those after his reading. Now, here's our intro to our major presenter today. Dr. Michael Mendes is an assistant professor of environmental planning and policy at the University of California, Irvine. Irvine. Michael has been more than a decade of a senior level experience in the public and private sectors where he consulted actively engaged in the policymaking process. In 2021, California Governor Gavin Newsom appointed Dr. Mendez to the Los Angeles Regional Water Quality Control Board, the board that regulates water quality and in the region of 11 million people. As a youth in Pacoima, Silmar and Lakeview Terrence, Michael was surrounded by people resisting environmental racism whether protesting the sitting of landfills, landfills or organizing to demand the cleanup of toxic properties. They sought to understand how the situation originated, to develop alternatives and to imagine new environmental future. And we just were informed that our guest speaker and presenter today is a recipient of the Andrew Conridge Fellow. And so we would like to congratulate him and he's gonna talk a little bit more about that. Welcome Mike, we're so excited to have you. Uh, th thank you so much. I'm excited to be here and honored to be here. Thank you to Abuelas en Acción, uh, Familias en Acción, and of course to Tia uh, Chuchas uh, for sponsoring this great event. As it was mentioned earlier, I grew up partly in, in Silmar. My parents actually still live in the Northeast San Fernando Valley. And I've, kn I've known many friends and I visited the bookshop at its various locations. So uh, thank you to all the organizations today and um, really, um, uh, uh, prioritizing what uh, the climate change means, what sustainability issues mean to the Latino, Latinx community. So uh, thank you for this opportunity. So as it was mentioned earlier, I'm gonna talk a little bit about my book, Climate Change from the Streets. I'm gonna provide a broad overview of some of the key themes and concepts uh, that I am seeking to highlight and profile 
in the book, are particularly leading and forefronting people of color and climate activism and leadership around climate change. Also, um, what I'm uh, really going to start focusing on after that is do a traditional author reading from one of the chapters, chapter two on climate embodiment, about how people of color embody climate change impacts, as well as activism and other forms of inequalities in, in our built and natural environment. So this will probably be one of the first times that I've ever really done a, a traditional author reading, because uh, mm -hmm. at Academic, we, uh, we usually just do sort of a research um presentation so this should be a a, a fun uh an interesting um uh, process for me so i want to start off with this uh this image here of the polar bear you know about 10 15 years ago uh the, this this image of polar bear was very ubiquitous and very tied to the idea of climate change when people spoke about climate change uh a couple years ago it was about how climate change was affecting ecosystems um, ecological systems and animals and um, other types of uh, uh, parts of nature out there in the wilderness, out there not happening in, in our streets, in our barrios, or in, even in our own backyards. So th this is, is a, a flyer, an organizing flyer from activists, uh, primarily uh, people of color in Oakland, California, Northern California, that are really, that really tried to decenter that image that didn't put people of, of color at the forefront. And uh, uh, this saying here, it's not just about polar bears. It, 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 it was actually a radical um, statement about 10, uh, 12 years ago when they were making the statement of trying to center the climate change movement on low-income communities and uh, uh, people of color. So as we can see from this, this um, flyer here, they're arguing it's not just about climate, uh, it's not just about polar bears, climate justice is about youth. And you'll notice here, uh, the word youth um, is emphasized the, as the, well, you, the individual, really trying to put that human-centered approach to climate change activism and places like uh, uh, Oakland, which at the time was almost two thirds of people of color. And um, one uh, key quote in the research that I have done over the last uh, two decades on climate justice and environmental justice in California and beyond is this quote from Brian Brevage. He was a, he's the co-director of the West Oakland Environmental Indicator Projects. This was a, a people of color uh, led organization uh, that focused on environmental justice. And he told me uh, a couple years ago is, up until the last decade, climate change tended to be a white, affluent issue about saving rainforests and polar bears. It hasn't had deep relevance for people trying every day to get by in their urban centers. Most of the messages of climate change are about eliminating global greenhouse gas emissions and not about people. So again, here trying to decenter the abstract notion of climate change that is happening out there, somewhere outside um, in the wilderness and not in our own backyards, not climate change from our streets. Having more representative messages and uh, uh, frameworks around climate change is important because in, pla uh, in places like California, uh, we are experiencing a major climate change crisis and historic racial unrest. In the last several years, millions of people have been impacted by multiple disasters, fires, blackouts, heat waves, droughts, uh, hazardous air quality, uh, a, a deep economic recession, and of course the ever-present COVID-19 pandemic. These are all major life events, and these compounding of disasters have cascading health, social, and economic impacts. And due to existing structural inequality, these impacts are disproportionately affecting low-income people of color. To address the climate emergency, activists and policymakers have proposed the Green New Deal at the federal level. Many of you um, know uh, this as a radical proposal to decarbonize our economy and address poverty and inequality. However, for the last two decades, low-income co uh, communities of color have also pushed state and local governments to experiment with reducing greenhouse gas emissions and approaches that also address inequality and public health. These efforts in climate change experimentation have been contentious and are often met with significant resistance. Well, I'm supportive of, of the Green New Deal, I'm here to say that there's nothing new about the Green New Deal. 
climate change experiments in places like California since uh, the year 2005 have been all out street fights. Environmental justice activists are often pitted against traditional environmentalists who favor the least costly mitigation solutions, which do not necessarily maximize equity and public health outcomes in low income communities of color. These conflicts over climate change are cultural at their core. They illustrate that although the science of climate change are, is clear, policy decisions about how to respond to its effects remain contentious. Even when such decisions are claimed to be guided by objective knowledge, they are made and implemented through political institutions and relationships and all the competing power and racial struggles that this implies. So if we look towards the example of California, it reveals the contingent nature of climate change policy, the assumptions and social, political, and cultural attitudes that often create conflict between community understandings of local environmental conditions and the prevailing global top-down conceptualization of climate change. In California, tensions between different approaches to addressing climate change are often on the politics of scale, economics, class, and race. These differences in worldviews, if unacknowledged, can lead to the breakdown of trust, even among groups that are normally working towards the same goal, reducing the harm that climate change would do to uh, human societies and our planets. So for insight into national level conflicts between groups working on climate change solutions, one should look to the ne nearly two decade California experiment of incorporating environmental justice and health equity principles into climate change policy. For environmental justice activists in California, the main threat uh, from climate change is the disproportionate harm it causes to their bodies and the health of their communities. For them, climate change is not just about global greenhouse ga gas models, rather it is also about the opposing worldviews to which policy and science is seen. Yet California is still often seen as this homogenous entity that uniformly values environmentalism and climate uh, action. This image universalizes the idea of climate change and detaches it from its cultural settings. It also obscures how the localization of environmental policy and science within the state involves processes of public conflict and legitimacy. For example, in this uh, recent book uh, that was published by a major university press, won several awards, it describes itself as the definitive book on California's environmental history. It traces California's environmental history from the times of, the, uh, of John Muir and, and the establishment and founding of Yosemite to modern times dealing with climate change. And this 300 page book, um, people of color are only mentioned in passing and referenced twice in a, in a very uh, casual manner. Uh, so th there's this traditional environmental narrative of California that facilitates the ratio of people of color in enacting comprehensive environmental policy and leadership. So therefore, I published my book, Climate Change from the Streets, with the explicit focus on people of color. And my book foregrounds people, place, and power in the context of climate change and inequality. Moreover, this research or originated in my public policy work for the California State Legislature during a 15-year period. This provided me valuable insight into how the interactions of governments, businesses, and NGOs shape climate change policy. My research is further influenced by my experience growing up in Latino communities of Los Angeles that face multiple environmental threats. As the youth in places like Pocoima, Silmar, and Lake Terrace, I was surrounded by people resisting environmental racism whether protesting the siding of landfills or organizing to demand the cleanup of toxic properties, they sought to understand how these situations originated, to develop alternatives, and to imagine new environmental futures. Thus, this has focused my work on what the conceptualization of environmental justice and climate change has meant to activists, policymakers, experts, and scholars alike. In closing, this embodied research examines new models of engagement with climate change and justice, and it makes space for alternative paradigms and narratives of environmental protection and activism. My engagement with stakeholders since the year 2005 has allowed me to critically analyze how the success of climate change policy in California and beyond now depends on incorporating marginalized voices 
and embodied perspectives from local and global scales. So I look forward to uh, hearing uh, uh, more from our audience and engaging in a, a constructive dialogue around these issues. But before we go into that, I want to, um, to, uh, pr to provide a little bit of uh, a author reading from one of the chapters, chapter two, um, which is called climate embodiment. So embodiment is a big theme in my book of how people are literally embodying the injustices of poverty, racism, inequality, pollution uh, in their bodies and, and their nature uh, and the natures in which they inhabit um, and places in which uh, they work, play, and worship. So to begin with, chapter two, uh, climate embodiment. At Paris Elementary School in the city of Richmond, California, the students practice not only emergency earthquake drills, but also chemical explosion drills. The public school is situated less than a mile away from a major oil refinery. When an alarm warns of the incident at the refinery, teachers run to shut doors and close windows. Students are told to, co uh, told to cover their faces with tissue paper. In the surrounding community, residents are given shelter in place warnings. These are, uh, they are instructed to stay inside, close windows and doors, turn off air conditioning and heating units, and use duct tape to, turn, uh, to seal off airways. Children growing up next to the refinery often report problems such as asthma, headaches, and other ailments. According to long-term uh, Richmond resident Sandy Saturn, quote, there were incidents at the refinery when I was little where they would, uh, uh, where there would have, would, they would have a spill. I would get so sick that I would have to go to the hospital. My eyes uh, swelled almost closed and my body would be covered in hives, end quote. For communities living next to polluting industries, preparing for emergency explosions and seeking medical care for the short and long-term consequences of breathing some of the nation's dirtiest air are fundamental to their experience of the local environment. Throughout California, these sources of air pollution are disproportionately located in low-income communities of color, which have far fewer resources to resist, uh, politically adapt and recover. That a study show that environmental regulations in these communities are poorly enforced. Enrichment violations of air quality rules are frequent. According to city officials, over a 10 year period, they were 13.1 violations per 100,000 people compared to 0.96 for the entire San Francisco Bay Area. Environmental uh, health risks raise a central question for these communities. What are the, what are the links uh, that their human bodies make and manifest every day between in inequities, disease, and death. And on the other hand, an environmental justice and well being on the other. Or framed another way, how do the dynamics of power and inequity express themselves through population distri distributions of health, body size, disease, disability, and death? Areas such as Richmond has given rise to forms of activism centered on environmental justice, which attempt to redress the structural and historic inequities that expose low-income communities of color to, to harm from fossil fuel burning and other forms of industrial pollution. The ways in which environmental justice advocates view climate change are directly informed by their lives in such communities. Many have expressed or seen firsthand the physical harm that residents suffer in neighborhoods close to polluting facilities. Their perspectives on pollution are embodied and concerned with its physical and social dimensions. The, the, their measures of pollution are often community-based and qualitative rather than abstract and quantitative. Their local values and goals uh, tend to be at odds with those of the policymakers traditional environmental organizations, scientists, and bureaucrats who shape climate action at a global scale. This chapter examines the theories and perspectives that environmental justice advocates bring to their work in climate change from the streets. Key to the worldview is an understanding of the human body as a site of intersection, uh, intersection between social, political, and environmental dynamics. Activists view climate change as an environment, activists view climate change as an embodied phenomenon that has multiple impacts on the people who live with it every day. These insights are tied to a keen sense of the ways in which health is determined not just by physical choice, not 
uh, by personal choices or genetic makeup, by the range, but by the range of social and historical factors that hinge on race and class. Through organizing and lobbying efforts, environmental justice advocates have been able to disrupt and the dominance of the carbon reductionist worldview and climate change policy. They have introduced embodied local forms of knowledge and perspectives into public debate and transform climate change solutions. Their worldview, their worldview that environmental justice advocates share has its roots in communities such as Richmond, California, and its origin uh, and workings are key to understanding climate change from the streets. Richmond is home to one of the world's largest oil companies, the Chevron Corp Corporation. Its refinery is also California's single largest source of greenhouse gas emissions. Ch Chevron released 4.5 million metric tons in 2010 alone. Es established over a century ago, it, its processes, it processes more than 250,000 barrels of crude oil each day. Chevron spans across five square miles of Richmond and its smokestacks are as tall as skyscrapers. The hundreds of tanks that dot the refinery uh, can hold up to 50 million barrels of gasoline, jet fuel, and diesel fuel. The Chevron refinery releases nearly 600,000 pounds of other hazards, hazardous and toxic emissions into Richmond's envir uh, environment each year. Over 25,000 people, including those and two public housing projects, live within three, within three miles of the refinery and less than a mile uh, away are playgrounds and two public schools. Nearly 85% of these residents live below the federal poverty level and more than two thirds are people of color. Environmental justice groups argue that refinery pollution not only fuels climate change, but also contributes to high rates of asthma, cancer and, public, and health, uh, heart disease. According to the California Department of Public Health, Richmond residents, residents of all ages are almost twice as likely to go to hospital emergency rooms uh, for asthma attacks as others, living in, uh, as others living in the region. African Americans in the area in particular have the highest rate of asthma emergency visits uh, and emissions in, in the county at a level four times that of other racial groups. A 2018 study by, the, uh, by Laura Cushing uh, found that California facilities emitting the highest levels of both in greenhouse gas emissions and particulate matter tend to be located in neighborhoods with higher per uh, proportions of residents of color. Another study has confirmed this trend even when controlling for household income for a wide range of co-pollutants, including particulate matter, nitrogen oxides, and sulfur dioxide. Chevron's Richmond refinery exemplifies the difference between mainstream and environmental justice views of climate change and its relationship with various forms of pollution. The chief objective of California climate change policy is to, to reduce global greenhouse gas emissions. But environmental justice advocates argue that climate action should also address equally pressing problems with local air quality, which are caused not by greenhouse gas emissions, by, by, but by other harmful solutions that are often released with them into the atmosphere through the burning of fossil fuels. Benefits from the direct reduction of greenhouse gas emissions can yield important opportunities for public health in the form of reduced co-polluting emissions. Environmental justice groups uh, began with this premise that climate change policy should take a holistic approach that integrates multiple pollution uh, dimensions. For them, efficient, efficient policy design would seek greater, uh, greater greenhouse gas emission reductions where health co-benefits co are most needed. Activists uh, uh, contend that the failure to maximize pollution reductions in the state's most affected areas, such as Richmond, could reinforce a history of unequal exposure. Several environmental justice health researchers have supported this premise uh, and argue that policies that focus exclusively on reducing greenhouse gas emissions can be ineffective in reducing pollution, particularly reinforcing structures of environmental inequality. Climate change is a complex problem involving intricate um, interactions among biological, physical, and social systems. Holistic um, uh, solutions de demand collaborations among scientists, policymakers, and diverse publics, including active consult uh, consultation with the communities most burdened by climate impacts.
Using the concept of climate embodiment, I examine how environmental justice groups are creating new forms of environmental expertise. This expertise has its roots and experience. Residents of, of neighborhoods such as Richmond are literally embodying climate impacts and pollution using uh, their lived experience to enact social change. Humanizing uh, climate change is not an easy endeavor. Policymakers and traditional uh, environmental organizations are often invested in global scale perspectives of the, of the problem. Pinpointing its effects uh, at the community um, and individual scale can be difficult in part because the science of how people embody multiple impacts uh, is complex and can be contentious. Environmental justice advocates, however, are gaining influence in, in the public uh, uh, policymaking process. I was uh, introduced to the embodied approach to climate change when I met Mer uh, Mary Rose Tarouk, an advocate with the Asian Pacific Environmental Network. Tarouk's experience with this group led her to fight for formalized state level assessments um, of the impacts that pollutants from multiple sources can ha have on the bodies and well being of local residents. This multifaceted experimental uh, uh, approach has uh, directly shaped her activism around climate change. I sat down with her a year after a major fire at the Chevron refinery in Richmond. The fire on August 6, 2012 engulfed 19 workers and sent 15,000 area residents fleeing to hospital emergency rooms after suffering from respiratory problems and vomiting. It created a vapor cloud uh, four miles wide uh, of sulfuric acid and nitrogen dioxide. Chemicals that can affect the, uh, the skin, eyes, and respiratory and gastrointestinal uh, tracts. The fire also released greenhouse gas emissions that fuel climate change. This was the third major fire at the oil refinery in 12 years. All, all were caused by leak, leaking pipes, and, and federal investigators blamed the fires on Chevron's ne negligent uh, safety culture, flawed emergency response, and failure to inspect and upgrade uh, vulnerable piping. Taruk, a Filipina American whose indigenous uh, uh, indigenous Tagalog uh, 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 indigenous uh, uh, last name means to know, has uh, worked uh, for over 15 years in environmental justice movement, and she traveled to various organizations. Uh, and, and she really uh, talked about how, and I'll conclude here. Really talked about how this was an embodied experience for her engaging on, in climate justice activism. Uh, because she saw her children and family members being affected by the the uh, the fire at Chevron Refinery, uh, developing asthma. So for her, it was an embodied perspective, and and a direct quote was that it was like Mama Bear protecting her children, and that was really propelled her into uh, climate change activism and specifically environmental justice activism. So as you can tell uh, from this brief uh, reading of climate embodiment, how these impacts, these fires, and various forms of pollution from the Chevron refinery, uh, California's single largest uh, greenhouse gas emitter, and one of the largest uh, polluter of local pollution um, that affects people's health, has fueled much activism around climate change and environmental justice. So thank you for this opportunity and look forward to having an engaging conversation. Well, that's really loaded in terms of sharing of that chapter and what it's done to people. And we don't think about it when we see these smoke stacks everywhere in different refineries everywhere, everywhere as well. So thank you for that. I wanna remind our, our listeners also that if you have any questions or comments to please do so. Mike, could you please tell us a little bit about your family's business, Rudy's Bike Shop? and what you learned as a child from your neighbors about environmental inequities and how you were guided to, in your career, a passion for environmental policy and justice. Yes, so that's an interesting um, question and thank you. One of the two things uh, besides growing up in the environmental justice community was my experience of my family owning a small family run immigrant serving um, uh, local business uh, 
business that was he struggled to survive uh he um opened my parents opened rudy's bike shop uh, the first uh, latino owned bike shop in the san fernando valley uh which uh at the time was a region of 1.1 million people and did not have a, a latino um uh, bike shop owned bike shop and very few bike shops in northeast san fernando valley and they opened that after my father had a work, had worked at the at the Van Nuys um, uh, General Motors plant uh, for many decades, along with my grandfather and uncles. And they closed that. Um, and to see my father going into going from a one career, which uh, obviously contributed to a lot of the pollution in our communities, uh, you know, cars. Uh, uh, gasoline cars to a business that really promoted uh, sustainability uh, was quite impressive. And for him to do that when he was 50 years old and to have the courage to uh, be able to uh, invest in um, a, a, a a business that wasn't going to make a lot of money, um, but uh, to serve the community. And so we would see, uh, I, you know, I, I, I worked there as a teenager and I would see a lot of immigrant families, particularly uh, men and women um, that were undocumented coming in and uh, uh, not um, uh, buying bikes or trying to repair old bikes because they wanted to exercise or, or you know, to live a healthier lifestyle because it was a necessity because they, they couldn't drive um, they couldn't, or they couldn't afford a car and insurance or get a driver's license. Um, and they were relegated to uh, either public transit uh, or riding a bike. And I, I would see that, that sort of inequities, but also see the high proportion of them um, getting in accidents because our infrastructure in many Latino uh, communities is not built for uh, the pedestrian, pedestrian, let alone for um, an individual on a bike. There a few bike lanes are protective measures, um, potholes, um, uh, uh, drivers and cars that don't respect bi uh, bicyclists. So I, I would see that inequ uh, inequality of how our Latino communities has crumbling uh, infrastructure and the in the first place because of his uh, uh, historic inequalities, uh, racism, uh, uh, legacies of uh, redlining um, that uh, relegated people of color to some of these communities with little resources and, and, and uh, public um, services. So as we see uh, climate change impacting our communities, uh, climate induced disasters, extreme heat, drought, extreme weather events that are happening and impacting our communities. Our communities are first and hardest hit um, uh, uh, primarily because of this crumbling uh, infrastructure and political choices that have been made to withhold um, improvements and resources for our communities can thrive on a daily basis and also be able to safeguard ourselves uh, from these impacts of our changing environment. So uh, seeing those inequities in our built uh, environment, in our infrastructure, um, people not having resources uh, and or transportation op options was a big impact in those years, um, uh, uh, those 10 or so years that I uh, worked in that bike shop again in uh, Latino immigrant serving um, population. Thank you. Um Good afternoon, uh, Mike. This is Consuelo. Um, um, I recently uh, retired from working with in public health for like 26 years. So it brings me to um, all the work that here in Portland, Multnomah County that we've done, but there's so much more um, to do. And your story of your family is really enriching. And seeing now as an example in Portland that there are bicycle shops and um, used bicycle shops that they're really working to make sure that communities of color or low income communities uh, get an opportunity um, for the children and the adults to have those bikes. So um, it's about going forward. And yeah. um, I really loved your story. Um, could you tell us, uh, please talk about your recent article about queer and present danger, understanding the disparate impacts of disasters on the LGBTQ plus communities. You write that LGBTQ communities are often, often rendered invisible within the disaster policies with those who are additionally marginalized by such systems as ableism, immigration status, and others. 
Um, can you tell us what these negative impacts look like? Well, thank you. Uh, excellent question. And thank you for joining us today. Uh, mm -hmm. Happy Pride Month for everyone. Um, happy June Pride Month. And that that article first uh, was really a genesis from another project that we could talk about uh, momentarily that I first started looking at undocumented Latino and indigenous migrants, primarily farm workers, uh, domestic workers and other outdoor workers that were being disproportionately impacted from wildfires throughout California. The first project looked at uh, Ventura and Santa Barbara uh, County from the Thomas fire. Um, then I started uh, investigating through the Carnegie Fellowship, um, mm -hmm. Sonoma County, um, uh, farm workers there with experiencing multiple forms of um, extreme wildfire events year after year. And Sonoma County, unlike uh, the Central Coast and Santa Barbara County, has a, a much higher population of LGBTQ population, including Latinos that are coming from the San Francisco Bay Area, because at the time, maybe five, 10 years ago, was a much more affordable area. Uh, than San Francisco and the immediate San Francisco Bay Area, not so much anymore. Um, and I, so I would see these wildfire impacts, see farm workers that were transgender uh, working in the fields and and in, in interviewing um, un, um, straight undocumented uh, farm workers and then encountering this tra transgender population. And so I started to investigate it a little bit more and, and seeing similar to undocumented um, migrants in general, that this community was understudied and often rendered invisible. And so throughout the country, when a disaster hits, uh, we, uh, we uh, these, this community is often rendered invisible uh, because we often uh, think of them as this uh, idea uh, of, uh, white gay affluence myth that we often think of these individuals that are wealthy, white, and male, uh, gay, white, and male, and that are able to have the resources to defend themselves politically, socially, and most importantly, financially, uh, to safeguard them from these disasters. But uh, while investigating these with my uh, graduate students, we really uh, saw that this is not the case, particularly since uh, nearly a quarter of the population that's LGBT identified is from communities of color. And many of these individuals have traditionally the same indicators, uh, socioeconomic status, that makes other population groups vulnerable to disasters, such as having high levels of housing insecurity, um, being low income, having health disparity, existing pre-existing health disparities, no health insurance, low levels of education. And so we started investigating them and we, we seen particularly African-American uh, and transgender individuals were experiencing discrimination in shelters as well as um, not being able to find housing, transitional housing after disasters or uh, anti-discrimination um, policies um, that they were exp uh, that was geared uh, towards uh, protecting these communities. So understanding that uh, disaster, when a disaster occurs, this is probably one of the most, uh, this is probably the worst um, point in a person's life. They're either gonna have, uh, many of them are gonna lose property um, lose loved ones or friends, and they enter into a shelter or other type of uh, government assistance and encounter discrimination, um, and it's, it's, it's only heightened in that experience, particularly if it's a faith-based organization uh, that which are increasingly taking over some of the, the disaster um, uh, issues. So our, our uh, article on queer and present danger is really highlighting how uh, existing federal policies, both in terms of uh, grant making and uh, general policies uh, for uh, shelters, um, uh, do, do not have anti-discriminatory policies or how faith-based organizations can further stigmatize individuals and marginalize individuals um, during disasters. So these individuals can experience a hyper form of marginalization when a disaster strikes. Great, thank you. Mike. Um, thank you for bringing your passion and your lived experience to your work. Um, uh, there are a number of questions um, that I have for you, but first, please talk to us about your uh, Andrew Carnegie Fellowship, because uh, that's a pretty big deal. Period. But as a Latino, it, you know, we're we're saying yes, yes. So. Tell us about this and what this will mean uh, for your work and uh, certainly for, for all of us across the country. 
Thank you so much. I'm so honored to, to be a 2022 Andrew Carnegie uh, Fellow, uh, part of an impressive cohort of, tw of 27 other scholars throughout uh, the nation, which are um, a cohort of scholars, public intellectuals, and journalists. Uh, that are seeking to do uh, research that is public facing, uh, that has some element of trying to promote a social change um, in our society. And uh, it, it particularly the Andrew Carnegie uh, Corporation is providing me funding to work on my second book that's gonna be focused on disasters and particularly undocumented Latino indigenous migrants. So trying to expand how th this population um, is rendered invisible when disasters strike, as I mentioned earlier about the LGBTQ communities, this one is basically focused on all undocumented Latino indigenous migrants from wildfires, looking at heat waves, droughts, and compounding of other en en environmental factors. So I really want to be able to tell that story of how our governments are, are making political choices um, that are discriminatory um, and render the, this community invisible when a disaster strikes. So I'm really looking forward to continue this um, project and to uh, work on my second book. So provide me an opportunity to take next year off as a sabbatical to do additional research and most importantly, do some writing to um, propose this next book. And um, congratulations, on this congratulations. Uh, you know, um, we, Rosemary and I have the opportunity to meet you, um, I think it's been about a year, uh, uh, to come uh, on our podcast to talk about your article on the um, invisible, um, vulnerable community members that are ignored in disaster planning and implementing disaster um, or action for, uh, in a disaster. Um, and, um, so could you talk about um, the role of community health workers? Because I can't help, you know, as you're talking and Rosemary Consuelo and I have a long history of working with promotores de salud, uh, community health workers, and increasingly they are, their role in COVID um, response, uh, their role in, uh, also we've seen in Portland, Familias en Acción, their program, uh, they've, uh, um, they have a climate action program where community health workers are central to that in terms of notifying neighbors and, and you know, uh, being able to become uh, educate, educators in the community about climate um, change. So could you talk a little bit about what you see um, the role for community health workers going forward um, as uh, the climate increasingly becomes hotter and wetter and um, just all that is projected to continue to happen in the future? I, I, they, they play an important uh, uh, realm. I think the, the most important framing and connection that people can do around climate change is a public health uh, uh, focus, a public health framing and making climate change real, embodied, a public health perspective, the understanding that these impacts uh, that are happening to climate change are affecting our bodies, our health, the health of our children in terms of asthma, other types of respiratory diseases. And, and that why, that's why I wanted to read a, 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 a small sample of climate embodiment. And that idea of embodiment really comes from the field of public health. Nancy Krieger's work on how poverty, social inequalities are embodied in, in, in physically and symbolically uh, um, and, uh, uh, and people and, and, and their health. And, and just to put in context of uh, these disasters, particularly for undocumented uh, migrants, um, thinking about oh, uh, these individuals, particularly indigenous migrants, uh, and making the distinction that they're not Hispanic, they're not Latino, but they're indigenous. So they come from a region in Latin America, particularly, you know, Southern Mexico and Central Mexico, Central America, um, where they're they're marginalized because of their culture and their languages. And because of that, that, that marginalization, they're already working in, um, in occupations, particularly uh, in uh, and, and agricultural that, that are first and hardest hit from climate change. So uh, we traditionally think of migrants coming to the United States because of, of violence, uh, 
socioeconomic inequality and recession and trade wars, which are traditional push factors, but increasingly because of environmental decline and climate change, drought, extreme weather events that are wiping out economies, uh, agrarian economies are further fueling and pushing migrants, particularly indigenous migrants to the United States and, and places like California to work again in agriculture. And then they come to the United States and their first and hardest hit again because of uh, their undocumented status, their ingenuity um, by climate change. So there's this feedback cyclical injustices of climate change that they experience in their homeland. They migrate to the United States, hoping to get away from that disproportionate impact that climate change had on them. Uh, but then they, because of their marginalization status here, they're relegated to these jobs that are first and hardest hit from our changing environments. And, and, and the, the, the biggest impact is their health. Many, um, many of them are, are suffering from a lot of health disparities. And the, the field of it, uh, Bermatoras, uh, the environmental health field, are key to documenting and understanding those uh, issues. And um, the labor organization, my rights organization, teaming up with these public health and um, uh, uh, individuals is quite important. A second aspect of the research that I'm doing on these uh, uh, on wildfires, um, it's working with uh, epidemiologists to not to uh, do health risk assessments of what does it mean when, uh, from these hours, days, and weeks sometimes that these farm workers are working um, in this this toxic. Um, hazardous air quality. How does that translate to uh, morbidity um, and uh, mortality rates? So uh, the documentation and to be used in advocacy and policy change is quite important. And educating workers of the impact of prolonged exposure in terms of short-term and long-term um, health impacts um, is important to uh, uh, for these uh, farm workers to know and to educate, most importantly, policymakers, where we can have some change. Well, you know, and and you mentioned it. Um, uh, as we go forward, the politics are going to in, uh, enhance pitting the different groups against one another, and so it's up to us to be able to um, to stand firm to tell our stories, to tell um, the stories of those who are unable to share their experiences. You've talked about this, uh, the continuous impact of slow violence um, that just hits um, community members uh, day in and day out. And it's those stories that uh, we have to be able to publicize. Rosemary and, and Consuelo, I know you, you want to jump in. I see Rosemary has got to look like she, I know you want to. You know, I so appreciated the slides, uh, Michael, because when you see the visual of your body and all of the other stuff, that I mean, when I looked at that, I was like, oh my gosh, that's, that's really telling the story of what's happening. And I, I love your use of word of embodiment mm -hmm. because it affects our mind, body, and spirit on all levels. But I think the education portion is absolutely right on in terms of our community health workers um, understanding and knowing what uh, you know, what the impact is, both short-term, yep, that's the slide. It's amazing when you begin looking at that of what's going in and what we're breathing and, and how is that in, impacting and affecting us uh, day in and day out, especially those of us who are, are near uh, facilities that um, we're breathing it. Um, you know, one of the major chronic diseases here that we have because of the amount of, of fields that we have for cotton is belly fever. Mm -hmm. And not only are our kids and, and us getting belly fever, but our dogs are getting belly fever. Our animals are getting belly fever. And when you begin looking at this from a very um, focused view, I think it's, it's critical to understand. So that education is important. And yeah, I really do agree that our community health workers are helping document what's happening. And that's critical to your book and 
to our moving forward in terms of what is Mike, you wanted to you want to um, add some final words before we end and then Consuelo, I'll have you jump in, okay? No, I, 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 I thank you for this opportunity. And I, I think, again, as everyone was mentioning earlier, how critical it is to tell these narratives and uh, to tell them from a, a, a human centered approach and make climate change real, telling the stories um, from the fields, from uh, the oil fields, from, from the farm worker field to the oil field and how individuals are impacted disproportionately and also from an intersectional uh, perspective. And I don't, I don't know if you noticed that the human body was a woman's body. And I intentionally really focused on that and really understanding that under, it's not just people of color that are being disproportionately impacted by climate change, but it's women of color um, and their children or uh, uh, women of color um, uh, that are uh, of indigenous background and are at multiple inequities. And being able to tell the differences of these inequalities and trying to find solutions and broadening our perspective of what climate change is as a problem, of what communities and neighborhoods are affected disproportionately, and how together we can uh, build um, a solution and a framework that is more inclusive um, and more real to the embodied experience that we're experiencing in the streets or climate change from the streets. You know, and um, thank you. I would just like to add when we talk about community health workers um, in Multnomah County Health Department for years, there was a whole training, um, not only within four staff that were in those capacities, but also training in, in uh, communities, you know, for a variety of things, whether it was working with direct communities, with it, if it was working with teens, whatever it was, and we know the impact that communities of, of uh, or um, community health workers do with the promotoras, we know what they do and the strength and the trust that they gain from community. So it's a really important avenue to continue to use. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Thank you, Mike, for all that you do. And I'll tell you what, my hope lies with your students, what you are teaching them, uh, mentoring for them, because uh, we, we count on these smart um, students to be out there teaching all of us uh, what we uh, should be doing and what we can do for a more, um, uh, equitable approach to climate change uh, or climate action. We we have no choice. Um, we and it, it's uh, we must do it now. So um, thank you again, Mike, for being with us. And I want to remind uh, our viewers and listeners that you can order climate change from the streets from Tia Chucha's books at tiachucha.org. And I want to thank Tia Chucha Centro Cultural and Bookstore. Karen and Brian and the whole team for all you do to make this happen. And to Familias in Acción in Portland, Oregon, Rachel and Nicole and Izzy, um, again, uh, you support us. And this is um, important to us to be able to bring presenters like Dr. Mendez to share their expertise and their passion, uh, to share stories and to change the narrative on what we commonly hear from the government and uh, white dominant culture about how to, um, for climate action. So thank you. Thank you for being with us here today. And please join us on Abuelas en Acción, a multicultural podcast for our common good. Buenas tardes. Thank you.